Let's all stand, grab a hymn book, and turn to hymn number 299. 299, we will sing the first verse and the chorus for our opening for July. to go to the Lord in prayer, but also keep Bill Gant. His leg is still, is it still swollen and bruised? And we have Amber here today. Keep her in prayer. She seems to be doing better. Um, just for those who are out traveling too, let's prepare our hearts. As we come into your presence to glorify and praise your holy name, that we would do it with a joyful, grateful, thankful heart, Lord, to be in your presence, to draw nigh unto you, Lord. And Lord, I ask that you would speak to us. We know you've prepared the day, you've prepared the word, and that you have the message ready for us. Father, I ask now that you would just help us to be grateful, to be joyful, and that we would exalt your holy name, that we lift you up with our worship. I ask now, Lord, that we lift Bill Gant up with his leg and Amber that you would be with them. We ask that you would grant the doctor's wisdom for them. We ask for your hand upon those who are traveling that you would give them safety and that they would have a good day and a good vacation. And Lord, that we would have sweet fellowship with you, Lord, and that there would be nothing between us. And Lord, I ask that you would bless this time, that you would be glorified, that we lift your name up in the precious and holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's all stand again and turn to hymn number 587. <laughs> 587 at Calvary. Some awful verses. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was true.
my phone this week because I forgot to print these. Two, 644, 644, we'll sing all the verses of this one, I think there's three. <clears throat> 644. events. Wednesday at 7 p.m. is our prayer meeting. Thursdays of this month there is no John and Romans. Enjoy the summer break. Friday at 7 p.m. is our you. On July 23rd is a woman's prayer meeting here at the church 9 a.m. The ch there is child care provided. August 15th through the 19th VBS. Please sign up. We need workers. We also have a cookie and sign up sheet coming soon as well. If you have any questions please see Melissa. And Melissa is on vacation. She will be out of the office until July 25th. And yesterday, CareNet raised, they, their goal was for 30000 They raised over 32000 So thank you to those who, who came out and supported it. Um, Dan? We'll stand one more time for our offertory hymn number 356. Whosoever will, 356. Ushers, you can come on the chorus of the last verse. 356.
the Lord back a little that he's given us so much. I ask that we would do it with a joyful and grateful heart. Marty, would you ask the blessing on the offering?
again while I grab my phone. Hymn number 112. Number 112, we'll sing all four verses. all day today. Come on up, Wade. Praise the Lord. It's worth traveling an hour and a half just to hear that music. It really is. It's a real blessing to be here. Uh, tonight I'm going to attempt to preach a message about the pet names of Jesus that gives to uh, like Israel and Jerusalem and us. And I thought if you wanted to hear a little bit about that, because you guys have named me, you girls and boys have named me Baptist Prime. Uh, you don't know it, but because you did that, uh, you showed it. Uh, it's a term of endearment when you give somebody a name like that, and that just tells me that you do love me here, and I, I really like that, like that thought that you do. And I love you guys. We love you both, all of you, and 
everything that goes on here. It's just a real blessing to be here. And I'm glad some of you are back in here that haven't been here in a while. I know because of operations or sickness or whatever. And I'm glad that you're here. We, we certainly want to have you here and be, be blessed in this church. Uh, I am going to, uh, oh, by the way, Faith, you probably play the piano like uh, Pastor Crab used to in our church. I mean, I literally see the thing jump off the ground when it's, when it's going. Yeah, I like to, I'm, I'm one that likes that. I, you know, I just do. I just think it's when we come into the house of God, man, we're ready to serve him and, and be joyful. You know, when we go out, it's a little different because we're now we're convicted under the word of God. And maybe the invitational hymn is, needs to be a little bit subdued, a little bit, you know, to get into our hearts and minds. But, uh, but I love coming in and hear that, that piano played that way. My daughter plays that way, too. And I, I miss I, every time I come here, I think of Lindsay and, and miss her greatly. Anyways, uh, I'm going to take you to Revelation 4. I'm going to take you there today. For I have not preached this message before. Uh, it's a message I preached to myself. Uh, it came do, to me during COVID when I was in one of the dark periods, and uh, I just needed to have a view of, uh, of heaven and of Christ, and I... Uh, so that's where I went with the message, and uh, I'm glad you uh, played the old rugged cross just a moment ago because that's a view that we see of him on the cross, and, uh, and that's a good view too, understanding what he did for us on the cross. But the next time he comes, he's not coming as a servant. He's coming as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And uh, I want to take a little glimpse of that today. Hopefully it will bless you and, uh, and be inspired by it. And I want to say this. Right? If there's someone in this sanctuary that hasn't, hasn't trusted Christ, hasn't been saved, if you don't get saved after this message, and I mean seeing Christ in all of his glory, because that's what you're going to miss out on, by the way, if you don't trust on Christ as your Savior, uh, you're going to be separated from him from all of eternity. But you need to have your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. There's, two, there's another book, a book of life, and that's whose names are written into it when they're created. But there's a Lamb's Book of Life, and those are the ones who are saved, are going to spend eternity with him, and... Boy, just think about hard about where your soul lies right now between that, that great breach of heaven and hell. Uh, and think seriously about changing that today and giving your life to Christ and knowing for sure that when you die, you go to heaven. Um, I don't want to see anybody spend eternity separated from God. Uh, it's, it's my goal in life to try to make that as clear as possible throughout my life uh, so that when I get to heaven, I'd like to see you all there, you know. I would love to be able to have a reunion like the reunion of all reunions and hear people say, hey, Wade, you know, and they say, how are you doing? Good, good seeing you, and glad you all made it. And, uh, and then disperse into your mansions and enjoy your families and enjoy Christ as the centerpiece of all eternity. So, so I want to pray first, and then we're going to reach, we're going to stand and read these uh, three verses, and then we'll get right into the Word of God. I might be a little lengthy today. Uh, that's what our, us preachers do. We, I like to say it first, and if I'm not, you, you're, you're like comforted by the fact that I, oh, he wasn't that bad, you know. So anyways, Father, thank you for this church, for these people. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the vision that you've given us, and especially the one that you gave John. Uh, a vision that we all need to see. It's one given to him and a special privilege that only the ones that make it there see. And yet he was able to come back and tell us about it and... Uh, and it inspired my heart when I read this and thought about it. And, Lord, I pray it does the same for your people. But most of all, Lord, I just pray that today you'd be glorified, that our hearts would worship you in a way, maybe, that we haven't worshipped you in a while, with all of our thoughts, minds, and actions. We just want to bring you praise today. We want to lift you up on high. We want you, Lord, to be the supreme thoughts in our hearts and minds. So, Father, thank you for your preeminence. Thank you for your providence. Thank you for bringing us here to be in your presence. So we'll thank you for all this, which what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me. Revelation 4. Remember, now, John is, is my favorite of all favorites. And the reason is, is because he was at every major event that Jesus was in, that was a part of. He was at the baptism. He went through. He was at the crucifixion. I mean, he was at the ascension. He was at every healing process. He was at every coming of the sea, and yet God gave him a special privilege uh, to go into heaven and actually see a little bit and bring that back to us. So it's very important to understand. I call him my assurance man. 
You know, you all have insurance men and women, right, that take care of your car insurance and all that. Well, he's my insurance man. I know I can go to John. I can hear exactly uh, what he saw and what he did. And, and that's the whole goal of John is to let you know uh, that this indeed is the Christ, right? I've been there, seen that, right, and, uh, and be encouraged by it. So I hope you understand that as we read this. John 4 after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which saith, Come up hither, and I'll show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately, he says, I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne. And I want you to catch these last words because I'm sure you've never heard a message preached on this. In the sight like unto an emerald. Like unto an emerald. Can you all close your eyes for a minute? I want you to picture what you just read. I'll read it again. Close your eyes and think about this. After this I looked and beheld a door was opened in heaven. Picture that door opening. And the first voice which I heard was it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I'll show thee things which, thou must, which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. Picture that throne. One sat on the throne. We know who it is. And he, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, and the slight sight like unto an emerald. Father, use these words to touch our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. John has always been my favorite disciple. I love him. I love all the books John wrote. John was more concerned about knowing who Jesus was and why he came and then he was about how he came and who he came through. So you don't hear, you don't hear the Christmas story in John. But I believe John was given more insight uh, of the things of God than any other human being that's ever lived. Um, he was uh, at every major event of Jesus Christ, including here, uh, where he was given a vision of the throne room and Christ sitting on the throne. I mean, it's an amazing vision. And unlike any other man that has been, uh, that has been given any, anything, including Paul and Daniel and Israel's patriarch Moses, John saw it all. And while on that Isle of Patmos, John was given a divine revelation of Christ in all of his glory in heaven, a door was opened unto him. And the first, think about this, a door was opened unto him, and the first sight he sees is Jesus. You know, when someone dies and they know Christ, the first sight, that's what they're going to see. I don't believe, I, I mean, I've, I've got, I can take scripture verses and say angels, escort, but the first, when you enter into the heaven, I think Jesus is there, right there, ready to open arms just to grab you personally. He sees Jesus glorified on his throne with all his majesty and splendor. And then the first voice he hears is Jesus. His voice was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with him. The Lord's voice, now think about that, was a loud and clear resounding command. I mean, it just took control. Come up hither. Come up here. Can you imagine what that might have felt like? The eternal king of heaven says to you, you may approach the throne. Oh, amazing. Get ready because that day is coming. Amen. And I pray you're ready. For many, this won't be a good day. Uh, for, but for those who know Christ, it'll be a great day. I remember watching a little boy back when Donald Trump was um, uh, speaking at some event, and there was a little boy that sent a note up to him through the Secret Service. I don't know if you ever saw this. And the boy just wanted to hug Donald Trump. And uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't very old. I'm, I'm saying maybe... Uh, Matthew's age or, you know, Ben's age or something like that, but he was, he, he just wanted to hug Donald Trump, and I remember watching a little boy, they escorted him up, who wanted to meet Donald Trump in order to give him a hug, and Trump did the unthinkable. He said, bring him up here, come up hither, and that little boy went up there, and then the unthinkable happened for that little boy, before that little boy had to, before he had a chance to hug Donald Trump, Donald Trump hugged him. And I just remember that feeling, and it made me think about coming into heaven for the first time, <laughs> And having somebody of that stature, you know, come up and just let our Lord Jesus Christ come on up and hug me. One of my favorite thoughts is, approach, is to approach Jesus with a hug. 
Uh, someone gave me a picture one day of that. There's a picture of, uh, of, of him hugging the, the, the prodigal coming home, and, I, uh, and then he first embraces you, and I love that thought. But it, like I said, it won't be a good day for many Christians, or for many non-believers, uh, when that day have, I, Our Lord in, informs John, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. You know, the, what he's saying is this. From this point forward, the focus of the book of Revelation is the hereafter. But up until this point, it was, uh, the, it was about the here and now. So in the first three chapters, right, Jesus gives John the seven messages for the seven churches. But now, John sees into the future. He sees into his own future, and he also sees into our future, uh, those that have trusted Christ. So immediately John said, I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So in the first three chapters, think about it, of Revelation, John was, was spoken to while he was here on earth. But here in chapter 4, his spirit had trans, uh, God had transported his spirit into heaven, and he saw and heard what no man has heard and what, and what was to come. So the first thing John saw was Jesus on the God, as God on the throne. And that might be a hint at what every believer will see first time they arrive in glory. It's to see Jesus on his throne as God. Oh, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall, uh, I shall see. And then notice in verse 3, he, sat at, uh, he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardin stone. Sardin or sard I, I don't like to say sardine, but I, it's, it has the idea of that, but a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow around it about the throne in the sight. And listen to me, like unto an emerald, like unto an emerald. Boy, did that hit home with me because I like that emerald color. John recorded one of the best visions anyone could ever have of Jesus in all of his majesty and splendor. He painted a majestic picture that the splendor of his eyes had beheld, and it just overwhelmed him. He, he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, sardine stone. And John likened his vision of God on his throne to a jasper and a sardine stone. We don't even know what they are because there's no description uh, of jasper stones. Generally, they were thought to be transparent gemstones ranging from purple to blue to green, but nobody knows for sure. So you got a glimpse of a color that we don't, you know, maybe that we've never even seen in this spectrum of where we live. So the sardine stone was also transparent, which was, uh, could have been, the sardine stone could have been blood red, uh, which makes sense. So it's clear here that Jesus, now listen carefully, stands out like no other, right, when he's on his throne. In fact, the entire throne room revolves around him. So in the, he is the centerpiece, a masterpiece of heaven all of et and all of eternity, eternity. And arching or over and above his throne was a rainbow like unto an emerald. For some reason, that caught my attention big time. This is hard for me to comprehend, but there was a rainbow or a halo effect over top Jesus that evidently was green. And I, what I believe is being illustrated here is that with all of these transparent stones and these colors is in heaven, what we do is we get the full transparency of God in all of his splendor. And that's Jesus. Everybody understand that? God is Jesus. The Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. And that's him on his throne. And this is what uh, Isaiah and Paul referred to in Isaiah 45, 23 and Romans 14, 1. He says, I looked, look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the, wor the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. Right? Romans 14, 11 says, and we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Everybody's going to stand in judgment. You certainly don't want to be in a white throne judgment. But in the beam of judgment, if you're born again, you're going to stand before him. And you're going to answer for every penny you spent, every word you said. I mean, every thought you thought. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you're going to have to answer to him for and give an, an account of. It's just that we're not going to be cast out of it. It's going to be according to the rewards that he gives us. So Jesus was God was now completely, thoroughly visible to the human eye for the first time, and he, he is, was, and always will be our God. It, it was now obvious and open for all to see because John saw and he brought that revelation back to us. Nothing was disguised, hidden, or concealed. It was all now crystal clear to John. 
with full transparency, Jesus revealed who he is, the God of heaven, and just as he said he was, Elohim, El Shaddai, the Almighty, Elion, the Most High God, El Elum, the Everlasting God, the Almighty God, the Great I Am, the First and Last, the Alpha and the Omega. That's our Jesus. Amen. And here Jesus sat, revealing with breathtaking royalty uh, and regal splendor his eternal preeminence and presence. Boy, I'm telling you, if there isn't a... This, this book opened up and, and will open up the eyes, the darkened eyes, the blind eyes, if you'll just look in this book and see what God says about himself. That's why I said in the beginning, you need to be saved. You're going to miss all of this if you're not saved. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. This is the God we serve. This is the guy that came down out of heaven and went into the skin of man in order so he could reach our hearts and save us from our sins. It must have been an awesome sight. John must have had all he could do just to breathe, let alone keep himself from collapsing to his knees. And then John continued to describe the other seats or the thrones which were situated apparently in a semicircle around the throne room. Uh, it seems like it was that, like the old amphitheaters over in Caesarea Philippi. Uh, you know, I, we were there, and me and Pat were over there, and they're really steep amphitheaters in a semicircle. And I remember Dr. Scudder uh, gave a message while we were there, and we're all sitting, and, it's, and they're pretty big, huge, and yet you didn't need any speaker system. He would just speak, and it would just, so somehow, however they built that, it would just transform into uh, uh, volume out into the, into the crowd. I remember um, one time going to, in uh, Northfield, Massachusetts, to a, uh, a, a conference out there uh, at D.L. Moody's where he preached and the same thing. He was just a little guy. He was only about this tall. In fact, I stood behind his pulpit. His pulpit was about this high. <laughs> and yet they said when he bellered, they could hear him in the very top in the nosebleed seats because of the way the semicircle and the steep, steepness of, of the amphitheater. So John continues to describe other seats and thrones. Going back to verse 3, it reads, and he sat... Uh, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow around the throne in the sight like an emerald. John says it was a sight to see. A, a, a true emerald is a sight to see. Uh, what was Jesus showing him? What was Jesus showing us? Why is this written in Scripture? Well, in the 16th century, I, I, just to go back and give you some... Uh, uh, Cortez brought back many emeralds from Spain, from Latin America, and one of the Cortez's most notable ones was, uh, was engraved on it. Among those born of a woman, there hath not risen a greater. And he, of course, was talking about John, all right, John the Baptist. Not, not this John, but John the Baptist. And, and Matthew 11 says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of a woman, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So among all the emeralds, now think about this. Among all the emeralds, this one was the greatest. And so John the Baptist was a great man, but a greater truth is here, right before our eyes. There is one greater than John, and that's Jesus Christ. Right? He is the one who John came to reveal and the one whom one day will reveal to all mankind. Whether you believe in them or not, one day they'll all bow before them. So the one greater that John is greater, uh, uh, the one greater than John is greater than anyone or anything you've ever seen or heard of on planet Earth. In other words, think about this. Standing before John is the most precious, priceless emerald of heaven. That's what I kind of, that's why I named this message, the emerald of heaven. I, I mean, this, this thoughts just overwhelm me sometimes. Uh, I just, because you look around us today and the earth is beautiful. It really is. If you've been around the world a little bit, there's places that are just beyond beauty. But when you look at this and you think about what it's, think about the, what he gave us down here and what he's going to give us when we get there. It's the proverbial ring we put above an angel that represents holiness. Do you understand that? That's what that halo is. When I thought of Jesus being the emerald of heaven, I thought of what it must look like to John 
with an emerald hair, halo around Jesus. A halo is that misty or foggy disc, right? That, or circle of light you see surrounding above or around. And Catholics use that a lot in the, you know, their pictures of the angels and Christ or the halo. So the only halos I've ever experienced are the halos you see in the headlights of cars when I had the cataract. That's, that's the only thing I ever saw. I had the cataracts taken out. I don't see the halos anymore. But they got so bad that I could not see the dry. But this amber... This halo associated with Jesus made me think, what is it when you look at that and all the splendor of all that Christ represents? So I wrote down 10 halo markers. You know, now this isn't really an expositional message. It's not even a topical message. It's just to make us think a little bit. What are some of the halo markers that to me represent Jesus and all his appeal and splendor? Because he is our, the eternal emerald of heaven which one day we're all going to meet and see. First one is this. He is the most triumphant of all powers. He is the most triumphant of all powers. Daniel 4.35 says, And all the inhabitants of the earth are, are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will and the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand. Or say unto him, What doest thou? Anybody falling into that trap once in a while? What are you doing, Lord? There's no one that can stop him. There's nothing and no one more powerful than him. He is immutable. He's imperishable. He's indestructible. Right? That is our God. By this I know thou favorest me, because my enemy doth not triumph over me. I always say, don't ever give saving Satan credit for nothing. I mean, you give all the credit for Jesus to Jesus for everything. Because he's telling you right there, your enemy's not going to triumph over you. You're one of his. For the Lord has made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. The only way I'm going to triumph in this life is, is to do it through the hands of Christ. That's the only way I'm going to do it. When I start to try to do it with my own hands, I fail very quickly. When you have Jesus and Jesus has you, you are favored. No enemy that comes against you will win. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. So whenever evil is meant against you, God will make good out of it in order for you to triumph through him. Now thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.14. Here's the second thing. He is the most transcendent of all paramounts. I love this. He kind of lives outside of time and space. Uh, in fact, turn over to Revelation 19 just quickly here. I think about that first word, when I saw heaven opened. It's almost like in verse uh, 11. It's almost like it's outside of time and the heavens that we know. It's like a curtain is pulled back and then you go into the the eternal spot, you know. It's amazing. So I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. By the way, that's going to be us. Clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he, he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God, of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a, a name written, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Can you imagine that? The curtain opens up, you know, out of time and eternity and space, and, and right there in the eternal transcendence of God, you see him in all of his glory. I said this morning to my wife, I said, um, uh, a couple things happened um, this past weekend that kind of started to open the curtain for me. We've been kind of looking for direction, what to do, how to do it. And uh, it's, it's been closed for a while. And he's just now starting to open up. I saw some things. I revealed some things through the word of God that I know of where he's taking, what he's doing. But this was the most transcendent of all paramounts. He is paramount to our salvation. It's not going to be your good works. 
not going to be your 25 years as a dedicated member. It's not going to be any of those things. It's going to be him alone, putting your faith in him alone, repenting of your sins. He is the highest of all the honorable. He is the king of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. He is the faithful and true one. He's the authentic one. He, the halo reminds me I serve the greatest of all greats and of all time. So he is the most predominant of all dominants. He's king over all his creation. He is the most preeminent of all preeminence. He is the Alpha Omega, the first priority in all things. He is the paramount of all paramounts. His kingdom shall never end. It shall never be overthrown. That's our God. Amen. And thirdly, he is the most tenderest of all plants. I love, this is my favorite one of all these ten. Um, because I need, I need a little tender care sometimes. But he is the tenderest of all plants. Listen to Isaiah 53, 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of dry ground, he hath no form of comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So all these pictures of these handsome Guys with the long hair, you know, you can kind of not think that way. He had no earthly comeliness, but he is the loveliest lily of the valley. Amen. He had no earthly beauty, but he was the most vivid rose of Sharon. He is the tenderest of all plants. It's more of, it's more, instead of a visual thing, it's more of a feeling thing. I mean, just look at him and your heart melts. I mean, it just takes you into another realm. The halo, halo reminds me that he is the sinner's friend. He's the one that anoints my head with oil. He is my everlasting kindness. He's the great physician. He provides the balm of Gilead, the healer of all nations and peoples. He healeth the broken in heart. He bindeth up their wounds. He bound my wounds years ago, set my feet on solid ground. He is the one who really cares when no one else does. He comes to you with healing in his w wings when you need him. He is the one who is truly concerned about me and you and has a tender, has a tender compassion on our weaknesses and our fails, failures. You know, how excellent is thy loving kindness, O God, o, o God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Psalm 36, 7. James 5, 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure... Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. And I like Luke 178. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us. You know, God looked down on us in, in mercy and just said, I'm going to send a tenderest plant I can send to him. Fourthly, he is the most treasured of all pearls. You know, pearls are got that look about them. That you ever see a pearl finish on a car the way they do it? It's just got that. I don't know how, how to explain it, but I love pearl finishes on cars. It's almost like it gives us two or three different visual visual effects. But again, the kingdom of God is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Boy, when you give your, when you when you see Jesus and all spend, you just want to give up everything you got for him. When you find Jesus, you find the most precious, perfect of all jewels. He's illustrious and priceless, a beautiful gem. You never want anything again but him. He is my shepherd, I shall not want. Right? But my God shall supply all your need according to his uh, his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He gives me everything according to his riches in heaven. You know what that tells me? Once I have him, I have. I am the richest man on the planet Earth. I may not have a penny in my savings account. It's fun living that way, by the way. Because uh, you know the next day he's going to provide something for you to get through the day. And that's so good. Here's the fifth, fifth one, right? He is the most touched of all passions. Our Savior is a passionate Savior. Yeah, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He feels your pain. He sees it when you're struggling through life. He feels our pains, knows all of our weaknesses. He sees all of our sufferings and sorrows, feels them himself. He grieves with us when we grieve. He mourns with us when we mourn. He is the one who tells us to Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. When, we, uh, when he saw those weeping over the death of 
Lazarus, he was troubled, it says, in his heart, and he began to weep himself. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he said, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. That's the way he looks at us. When he, when he saw them all, he saw them as sheep without a shepherd, starving without food. But thou, O Lord, art our God full of compassion. Full of compassion. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Every day I wake up, I think about his compassions. He got me through the prior day. He's going to get me through this day and the next day. Then six, he is the most trustworthy of all promises. How many here, your favorite verses are Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Anybody raise your hand and say, no, there's one. No, no way. Anybody else? Nobody? Honestly, usually I find about half the church raises their hand on that one. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Right? Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. It's one of the hardest verses to live by. I'm one of, I don't understand everything. And I said, no. and God many times just slaps me inside the head and says, you don't need to understand that. You just keep trusting me and you'll be fine. I don't know what path you're on, but if it's not on the path Jesus wants you on, don't trust it. Are you listening to me? Don't trust it. He's a lamp for your feet and a light for your path. He is the one who makes a way in the sea and the path and the mighty waters so they don't overtake you, the Bible says. So he will not leave thee or forsake thee, but it's much easier for him to do so when we stay on the path. You know? When we go off the path, he's got, to get out. he's got to go off the path himself to get us to bring us back to himself. He shows you the path of life where there's fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore. And he wants you to stay on that path, right? So 2 Peter 1, 4 says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Right? If you just kind of keep those binders on and, uh, from the world and keep looking to him and stay on the path, he's got great promises for you. Seven, he is the most timely of all purposes. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. That's what the Bible tells me. He makes everything perfect in his time according to his own purposes. So he hath made everything beautiful in his time. He has also set the world in their hearts so that no one can find out the work of God, the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. He wants to stay in that position where he is where you just want to know everything about him. And then he'll give that information to you as you seek him out and seek you know, through the word of God. He is, he is perfect and therefore his timing is perfect. He's never late. Right? He's always on time. The hail reminds me he came just at the right time for me. You know, I remember when I first got saved, I said, why didn't I get this when I was only five years old? And, and I hear these preachers get up there and say, yeah, I was saved at six years old, and I've had six, 50 years. So I'm thinking, oh, I wish I had that. I had to go through a little schooling of hard knocks, I guess, to it. Uh, I had to get the, the ointment there to open up my eyes so that I could see. But just the fact that he came for me, it just reminds me he came right on the right time. He knew exactly when I was going to trust on him, and it might be for you today. Right? This is the time. You've heard the gospel. How many times have you heard it? How many, how many people have said to you, you need to be saved, and you're just, you just say, well, I'll do it on my deathbed. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something. Um, Brother Adam Kossi didn't have a deathbed. He didn't know that day when he woke up he was going to drown and leave his family behind. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nothing can, and nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. That's Ecclesiastes 3.14 and Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. He knew exactly what he had to do, made of a woman, made under the law, uh, under the law that we would trust on him. Eight, he is the most talented of all pundits. You know, there's a lot about pundits today in politics, but a pundit is an expert in his field. I'm not sure, sure our politicians are experts in their field anymore. But what I'm trying to say here and what it reminds me of is that it doesn't, you don't get any wiser than Jesus. No wiser. 
Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, painteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. His wisdom is beyond what we can comprehend. He knows everything. He can do anything. He is smarter than anyone. Everything he does, he does perfectly and thoroughly. He is the best you're ever going to get. Give your life to him. Give your life to him. There's no one more wise than him. And right now we need a lot of wisdom. And that's right in this book that we have that he gave us. Great is our Lord and great power. His understanding is infinite. It's way beyond our understanding. Psalm 147, 5. He can do anything he, he, he wants because he knows everything and he needs, that needs to be done. So he's fully omniscient, right? He knows everything, flawlessly proficient, and he's faithfully sufficient. You know, one of the verses that I like in here is 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to think of anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Right? That's where our sufficiency is. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, who knoweth all things. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? He is our sufficiency. Here's number nine. He's the most truthful of all preachers. Sometimes I wonder about some preachers. If they aren't up here just to get all the glory. And there's other preachers that barely can stand in the pulpit because they know where they're standing. And they know that it's a very sacred spot and holy ground. And they want to give him all the glory. You can tell the difference. You can tell the hirelings, you know, from the ones that are sincerely sent by God. He's the most truthful. Henceforth I call... You not servants, for thy servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. John 15. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. He truly is the friend of friends. He, he is always honest, truthful with us, even if it hurts us. Why? Because he loves us. He removes the cloaks that hide our secret sins so that we can see them and repent of them and return to him. Deal with them so we can get closer to him. Matthew 10, 26 through 27, There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid, and that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak, ye, that speak ye in the light, and what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Matthew 10, 26 and 27. This is our God, everybody. This is the, the King of kings and Lord of lords with a hair, green halo, uh, rainbow type halo, halo around his head, setting on his throne, rules everything perfectness and holiness and he's the God who loves you he's the one who was once alive dead and once alive again it's amazing isn't it he identifies himself in the beginning of revelation that way and last thing we close he is the most thoughtful of all people my friends no one cares for you like Jesus. No one. I do my best to care for people. I do. But no one cares for you like he does. Casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. He hung on that cross as a man. As he hung on that old cross, now think about that, suffering for the sins of the world, thinking about you personally. All because he cared so deeply about you. Looking unto Jesus, right? The author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That joy that was set before him, you've heard this probably a thousand times in this church, was every one of you. Why would you want to grieve him by not receiving him as your Savior? Why would you want to miss seeing him in all of his splendor and in all of his majesty? You know, Isaiah wrote those words um, in Isaiah 53, almost 700 years before he came for you. Do you think he gave you enough time? I, I mean, amazing. I mean, put things in order. 
just so he could, so you would understand that he is the King of Kings and he is your Lord and Savior. The whosoever, in John 3, 16, I'll think about this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The most repeated verse, the most memorized verse in the Bible. That whosoever is you. Do you know you can't save the wrong person? You can't save the wrong person. During COVID, I, I wrote a track, and I called it, You Are So Loved, and it's based on this message. I haven't had the money to print it, <laughs> but clearly, um, but clearly it touched my heart. And I hope it touches you that nobody has ever loved you like he loves you. Nor will anybody love you like he loves you. The whosoever in John 3.16 is where we all start. Because that whosoever is you. And he couldn't bear to lose you. Just couldn't bear to lose you. He loved you too much for that. And that's why he endured the cross. That's why your debt had to be paid. Something only he could do so he could come. So he had to come and die in your place to give you his love and a new life too. I close. Listen, if there's anybody here that is unsaved, doesn't know 100% sure that when they took their last breath, they'd be in the presence of Christ, seeing him in all of that splendor. You must, you must be born again. What does that mean? It means repenting of your sins, trusting on Christ, receiving his gift of eternal life, and him personally as your Savior. And I can't explain it, nobody can, but once you do that, his spirit beareth with us witness with your spirit and you know that God moved in and you know it's changed you know you're not the same person you were old things become new right it's all of a sudden you're going in one direction and all of a sudden now you're headed in a new direction with the confidence and peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding so this is the one and only emerald of heaven who wants to shine in your heart today and take away uh, take away your sin he's already done that by the way and then take your soul unto himself to bring with him for all of eternity. So here's the way to be saved. Are you ready? I mean, you've heard it a thousand times. Some of you have heard it and never trusted on Christ. Just admit that you're a sinner and can do nothing to save yourself. But don't admit it to me. Admit it to God. The king, your king, your Lord, your Savior. Admit it to him. There's nothing you know. You've watched, you've heard. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. And turn to Jesus, the only, one that, the only one that can save you. And give your life to him. And he'll save you from hell and bring you right to himself. Right here, heaven on earth. Starts the moment you trust him as your savior. Secondly, just believe in Jesus and what he said and receive the gift of eternal life. But what comes with that gift is he himself. He comes with that gift. He offers you... Uh, uh, to escape God's wrath against sin and live both now and forever with him. He promises you if you give your life to him, he will come right now and live with you in this life and give you that confidence and assurance you need and the peace that surpasses all understanding. And then after you've done that, believe, just call out. You know, that's a simple, call. what is calling? It's just a prayer. Call unto me and I'll show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Listen, uh, call out to Jesus right now and say, yes, Lord, that's all. Accept his gift to save you from your sin. Give up the fight. Tell him to come and take over your life. That's all. I give up. I surrender. Yes, you're right, Lord. I know I need you. I know I can't save myself. I know that one day I'm going to die and spend eternity in hell. I don't want to end up there. I want to end up in your arms. I want to see you in all your splendor. I want to see you in all your glory. Lord, please come into my heart right now and save me. So let's bow our heads and eyes. And listen, if there's anybody in this sanctuary right now that is unsaved, oh, today, today, after seeing God in all of his splendor, right, call out to him. Call out to him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You got to call. You just got to tell him. You believe. You now believe. 
I'm no longer going to walk out of this sanctuary again or walk away from this uh, uh, Facebook page again and not trust you as my Savior. Just say something like this in your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me and coming and dying for me. A sinner who now wants to live forever with thee. Lord Jesus, I'm turning to you and away from my sin. I'm accepting your offer right now. Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. I'm asking you right now to come into my heart, save me and help me. I'm doing the best I can, but I want to do better for you. I want to live the rest of my life for you. Now with every head bowed and every eye closed, let me ask just simply by the raised hand, I'm not going to embarrass anybody, I never do that. Is there anybody in this sanctuary right now that just said that prayer? Just the best they could. They just said, I want to be saved, and I prayed unto God. Amen. I see your hand. Amen. I see your hand. Anybody else? I don't want to miss anybody. Because he doesn't want anybody left behind. He's given you a glimpse of himself to make you want him. Anybody at all? Anybody else that just said, I just now trusted on Christ as my Savior? Amen. Amen. As faith begins to play, God has spoken to your heart today in a way maybe that he's never spoken before. I trust uh, that you'll give it to him. And uh, if you want to make your way to this altar, I, especially those that have raised their hand, I want to talk to you. I want to share with you and give you some literature to read and to understand what you just did. And, uh, and if there's anyone here, Lord, that is obviously struggling in life, not understanding what they're going through, I hope today did something in their hearts. I do. I hope, Lord, that you did something in their hearts to reveal yourself in a way that will draw them to yourself, maybe even to this altar to bow before you. So we'll thank you, Lord, for all that you've done today in this sanctuary, and we continue to give this invitation, Lord, for anybody who would want to come, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. please everyone those of you who raised your hand I'd really like to talk to you if I could um, I'd like to share with you some things and just give you something and just love on you a little bit like Jesus loves on you and uh, give you some reassurance of what you just did is real you know I always say to people after they get saved or they give their life to Christ I said they're like newborn babies well, who's, what's easier to steal, that little baby right there or a full-grown adult, the little baby? Why, it's easier for him to come in and just rip that baby out of the arms of Christ. And I said, you know, don't know this, that once you give your life to Christ, that Satan's going to come in and try to convince you what you did wasn't real. And he's going to try to rip that, all that you just did. But listen to me, God's the one who's faithful. He's the one whose salvation he gave to you. It's not your salvation, it's his. When he pulls you into his salvation, he's the one that keeps you. He'll never lose you. You may fall or falter or fail sometimes, but you know you always have him to pick you back up again. Right? And it's important to know that because Satan is a, um, an adversary that wants us all dead. He just want, And he doesn't care about your life, by the way. He doesn't care anything about you at all. He just wishes that he can get you to hurt God by not believing him or doubting him or something he just did. And that's all. He's just back to get at God. He knows his time is short. So know that God is working. Amen? Amen. He's working in this church right now. We love you all. Thank you for coming, and I hope you come back tonight. I'll see you all.